All right, so uh, Luke 19, verse 13, the Bible reads, And he called his ten servants, and delivered them ten pounds, and said unto them, Occupy till I come. The title of the sermon this morning is, Occupy till I come. Let's start with verse number one. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Now you guys might remember just last week in the previous chapter, we had the young rich ruler come to Jesus Christ. And one thing that was preventing him from being a disciple of Christ was his riches. So I want to sort of parallel that story with what we see here in Zacchaeus. But what we see in Zacchaeus is that not only was he a publican, not only was he a government worker extracting money like a tax collector, but it says here that he was the chief among the publicans. This guy wasn't just a publican, he was like a supervisor. He had like a management position. He had other publicans under him. You know, he was directing them into what to do. So he, he, and he had a, a higher position, position than the average publican. All right? And the Bible says he was very rich. But verse number three, and he sought to see Jesus, who he was. So do you think this man knew of Jesus Christ? Do you think he believed on Jesus Christ? No. This man was a non-believer, okay? But he's heard of Jesus. You know, the fame of Jesus has gone throughout all Judea. People have been hearing about it. He hears about Jesus, and he goes, I want to know who this guy is, you know? I want to know who he is. And it says in verse 3, and could not for the press. There were so many people, the press, you know, it's not, not the press as we know it today, like the, you know, the, the photographers and the media. No, not that kind of press. But that's where they get the idea from, okay? When we talk about the press, it's because usually you have, you know, the... Uh, all, all these, uh, you know, TV and, uh, you know, um, media outlets, you know, trying to, to, trying to, to get a story, you know, about something. They call that the press. But it comes from the idea of there being multitudes trying to hear what Jesus Christ has to say, you know, and, and it's described as a press because there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people there. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot of people pressing into Jesus Christ. But he struggles to see who Jesus Christ is because, not for the press, because he was little of stature. Hey, he was a short man. He was short. And I, I take uh, great comfort in knowing that there were short men in the Bible as well, right? You know, I'm not very tall. I think I'm somewhere, in the, you know, somewhere average, but, you know, on the shorter side of things. But this guy is very short that he could not see Christ because of the people. And so how does he react? I love what he does in verse number four. You know, he, this, this, even though he's rich, he seems to be, and we see that he is a humble man. He does have some humility in him. Because he says, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. So he climbs up the tree. He wants to just get a glimpse of Jesus. Who is this Jesus that I've been hearing about? Right? He puts himself in a position where it's kind of embarrassing that as a short man, you've got to climb up a tree to see Jesus Christ. Verse number five, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. That's what I love about it. You know, it's almost like, Jesus just, just sees him on the, up on the tree, wanting to get a glimpse of him. Jesus looks up to him and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. You know, Jesus says, look, Jesus Christ invites himself in. He says, you know, I must abide at thy house. You know, and verse number six, and he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. I want you, you to get that picture in your head. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, let's you know, get your house ready. I'm coming to your house. Zacchaeus gets down, makes haste, gets things ready, and receives Christ with joy, joyfully. All right? And it's my belief, and you, you, you might have a different position here. That's okay. It's my belief that at this point, Zacchaeus received Christ. Not just physically in the house, but, physic but in his heart. That he had placed his faith on Jesus Christ. Because he does it with joy. You know, he, he's now, oh, this is Jesus. I'm going to receive this one. This is what I've been hearing about. Now, you know, I'm going to receive him not just into my house, but into my life. I'm going to place my faith on this man, Jesus. I believe this is the point that he was saved. All right? And uh, because this isn't the only time that Jesus Christ was received in other people's houses. In fact, we have a story that we've gone through already where Jesus Christ was, was uh, uh, received into a house of, of, the, of uh, um, the chief uh, ruler of a synagogue. But they did not receive him with joy. They received him 
so they could watch him. They received him so they could find some fault in him and accuse him of blasphemy or accuse him of whatever and get rid of him. But we see with Zacchaeus, he receives him with joy. He's thrilled at the fact that Jesus will be in his house. Verse number five. Well, actually, yeah, verse number five. Uh, uh, verse, I just read verse number six. So just very quickly, like I'm saying, I think, I think the receiving is a euphemism that he's received him in faith. Because many times in the Bible, when we talk about believing on Christ, putting your faith on Christ, many times it is referred to as receiving him. Okay? And I'll just give you some examples of this. You know, the most popular one that I like to quote when we go door to door soul winning is Luke 112. But as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So it's parallel in those that believe on him with those that received him. All right. And we also, you know, there's many references. I'll just read some to you. Luke 18, 17. It says, Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So then we have the, the idea of receiving Christ as receiving the kingdom of God. You know, so as a, as a little child. Um, also in John 13, 20, Jesus says, Verily, verily I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. Okay? So Jesus is parallel in there, placing your faith on him as receiving him. You know, Acts 2.41 says, Then they that, re that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there we have, you know, believing that this great multitude that believe on Christ, the Bible says they received the word. You know, Acts 11.1, 1, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 15.1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So believing the gospel is also referred to as receiving the gospel. And just finally, in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectively worketh also in you that believe. So we see there again, the believing is, is, is compared to receiving the word. All right. So I just want to show you that, that it's my personal opinion. When he received him into his house, he had believed on Christ. He had put his faith on Christ. Let's keep reading verse number seven. And when they saw it, they all murmured. So they see that Jesus has come to the house of Zacchaeus. They murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Hey, yes, yeah, Zacchaeus was a sinner. Yes, he was a chief publican, you know, uh, but, you know, we see that he received Christ. And this is not the first time that Jesus is being accused of, of being around sinners. But we know that Jesus came, you know, that he, he explained that, you know, it's the sick, you know, that it's, it's the sick that need the physician. You know, and, and so what we see here then is that Zacchaeus is seeing himself as someone that needs the physician, someone that needs the savior. Can you guys just turn back to Luke 5 for a moment? Luke chapter 5. I just want to compare this to you where, where we've seen that we saw this before in Luke 5. Keep your finger there in Luke 19, but in Luke 5, verse 30, Luke 5, verse 30, it says, So the same, very similar thing happens here. This is when, uh, when uh, Matthew. The apostle Matthew receives Jesus into his house and he invites his fellow publicans. He invites his fellow workers. It says, But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered and said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You see, these publicans, they came to receive Christ. Jesus says, hey, they recognize that the sinners in need for the physician. That they're in need of healing. And so we see the same thing then play out with Zacchaeus. He's a publican and he receives Christ. And he's someone that everyone just says, this is a sinner. Yeah, but he's willing to admit that. He's, a willing to, he's willing to admit that he's a sinner. Let's look at verse number 8, back in Luke 19, verse 8. Luke 19, verse 8. Now, we don't really know what transpires too much in the conversation with Jesus and Zacchaeus. 
But it says here in verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Say, look, God, I have too much. I'm very wealthy. I'm going to take half of what I have and give it to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. So look, he's willing to admit that he's made false accusations. He's willing to admit that he's cheated his fellow man, that he's taken more taxes than what they were required to pay. And so what do we see from Zacchaeus' heart? We see that he recognizes that he's a sinner. He recognizes that before Jesus Christ, you know? And so when we see this, we see then in verse number 9, And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation, come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, so you might say, well, maybe this is a point that he got saved. Maybe this is a point when he realizes, you know, that he's a sinner. Yeah, you know, that's fine as well. You know, I, I can accept that, you know. And, but we see what Jesus Christ says. He says, you know, uh, this day is salvation come to his house. So we know this was the day that he got saved. At what point exactly is questionable. But the reason I want to bring this to your attention is because this is a story, once again, that your works salvationists, that your, your false you know, uh, uh, preachers, that your false apostles, your false teachers that want to tell you, you know, you're saved by works or by good works. They're going to turn to this passage and say to you, look, Zacchaeus, look at him. You know, he's given money to the poor. You know, he's, got, he's, he's, re he's repented from his sins. You know, he's going to take, you know, full fold of what he took and give it back to those that he made false accusations against. That's how he got saved, they'll say, that he turned from his sins, you know. But is that what, what's playing out here? No, we saw originally he already received Christ joyfully into his house. All right? And we see here is that he recognizes, yeah, I'm a sinner. You know, he's able to do that. Now, let me say, for those that think he got saved because he gave half of his wealth to the poor, or he's, he's, he's willing to do it because, you know, he obviously hasn't had time to do it just yet. You know, he's willing to turn from his sins, you know. Maybe he hasn't done it yet, but he's willing to do it. Well, then why did Jesus just in the previous chapter say to the young rich ruler, to sell all that he had, not half of what he had, all of what he had, so that he would be in the kingdom of God. I'll tell you the difference between these two men is that Zacchaeus was willing to admit that he had cheated man. He was willing to admit he had made mistakes. All right? That's what brought him to salvation. He realized he needed the physician. He realized he needed the savior. Whereas a young rich ruler, you know, would not, you know the fact, he says, look, I've kept all the commandments from my youth up. You know, this was a man that was not willing to recognize himself as a sinner. He thought he was self-righteous. And that's why Jesus had to show him, hey, sell all that you have. You know, Jesus does not tell Zacchaeus, sell half of what you've got. It's Zacchaeus once he realizes, man, I've done wrong. You know, once he's received Christ joyfully, then out of that heart, he realizes, I better try to make things right. Okay, not that's what makes him that that's what got him saved. It's just that's just, that's just a natural outpouring. You know, when, when you're saved and you have the Holy Ghost in you, when you realize you're a sinner, you know, and you have that new man in you, you're more likely to say, God, you know what? I want to walk in your ways. You know what, God, I want to clean up my life. God, I want to be more holy. But this is once you are saved because you have now the Holy Ghost indwelling you. You've been born again. You have that new man in you. So please. Don't be misled by those that say, well, he got saved because he did good works, because he repented from his sins. Then why did the young rich ruler have to sell everything then? Because the difference is one man, Zacchaeus, admitted he's a sinner. You need to admit that in order to be saved. You need to admit that to acknowledge you need a savior. Whereas the young rich ruler did not need a savior in his eyes because he was fully righteous. He had kept all the commandments of God as far as he was concerned. Let's keep reading verse number 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. So he was near Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So this is the last time Jesus goes into Jerusalem and we know why he's going. He's going to pay for our sins. We know he's going to be that lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We know he's there to shed his blood so we can be forgiven and cleansed from all our unrighteousness. But he's going into Jerusalem and there are many thinking he's going to establish that millennial kingdom. He's going to establish a physical kingdom of God right now as, as he comes closer. 
And so Jesus gives this parable to explain what's going on. Verse number 12. And he said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So in this parable, the nobleman is Jesus Christ. Okay? So he's saying here in verse number 12 that before he establishes his kingdom, he first needs to go into a far country. He needs to go away. And we know what that means. We know that he, he, after he died, he was resurrected and he's on the right, you know, sits, sits at the right hand side of the Father. You know, he's going to that far country representing heaven for, uh, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So first he's got to go to heaven, receive the kingdom, and then return. All right? The, millennial, the physical millennial kingdom and then to return. Now I just want to read to you very quickly from John 18 verse 36. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Hey, my kingdom is not from here. Okay? But we know that his kingdom for the thousand years will be established on this earth. But it's not from this earth. The source of his kingdom is not earthly. Okay? We live in a corrupted, sin-cursed world. That's not going to be his kingdom is not going to be built on this sin cursed world okay his kingdom the reason it's called the kingdom of heaven is because the source of it is heavenly okay so when he comes back and he and he takes over the kingdoms of this world he's bringing in a new kingdom he's bringing in his heavenly kingdom which is from above all right but first he needs to go above first he has to go to heaven you know to bring that kingdom in all right so the points that jesus is bringing here is that the physical kingdom will not appear immediately. He has to first go away, then come back. All right? Verse number 13. So we continue the parable. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So he gets ten servants, he gives them ten, um, uh, ten pounds there. So each servant receives one pound each. Each servant receives equal amounts as the other. No one gets any preference there in this parable, all right? Everyone gets one pound each. Verse number uh, 14. And so now we have another group of people in this parable. But his citizens hated him, hated the nobleman, and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. So, okay, now you understand the, the, the parable? No man represents Jesus. The servants represent the believers, okay? We've been instructed to occupy till he comes. And then you have another group of citizens that hate Jesus Christ. These would be the non-believers. All right, the non-believers. Uh, let's keep reading in verse number 15. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to, uh, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. What does this tell us? When Jesus comes back to rapture us, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, He's going to inquire of us, what have we done with the pound that He gave us? So let's just get straight into it. What has God given to us? You might say, well, you know, we all have different talents. We all have different skills. You know, some of us can preach. Some of us can't, you know. But no, there was an equal pound given to everybody. There was an equal measure given to everybody. And the only thing that is equal amongst all of us is our salvation. The only thing that's equal amongst us is the knowledge of the gospel that can be equally shared. And the only thing that's equal amongst all of us is that we've all been given the ministry of reconciliation. We've all been tasked with getting out there and getting the gospel uh, to this lost and dying world, to our friends, to our families, to our neighbors, to our community. We've all been given the same task. We've all been given that same pound as to what we're going to do with it. All right? Let's keep reading. In verse number uh, 16. So Jesus wants to know. All right? He's going to ask you, what have you done with the pound that I've given you when he comes back? Verse number 16. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. So the pounds in the story is money. You know, it's probably silver or something like that. But he says, look, I've invested this one pound and I've gained 10. You know, we see, we see there's, a, there's an investment taking place here. He didn't, you know, waste it. 
You know, he saw fit to, to let that pound work. And now he has 10 pounds. He's gained 10. So he had one, now he's got 11 pounds altogether. And verse number 17, And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in, uh, in a very little, that, uh, ha- uh, have thou authority over 10 cities. What? All right. So God gives us something very little, something very small. Preach the gospel. Get the gospel out there. And the more you invest in that, the greater your reward will be. And we know that his millennial kingdom is going to come. It's going to, it's, it, his, all the kingdoms of this earth, all the towns, all the cities, you know, it's the Sunshine Coast, whatever, will all be under the authority of Jesus Christ. And, and based on what we've done for him, based on how we've invested that gospel, that gospel message, will determine what kind of positions we receive in the millennium. There are going to be some of you, I hope so, that will have authority over 10 cities, be given a great honor, you know. Let's keep reading in verse number 18. And the second came saying, Lord, thy pound have gained five pounds. So this man also invested into it, but he only got half of the, the, the uh, return, okay? Does, does Jesus chastise him? Does Jesus attack him? Well, you, only five? This other one got ten. Why couldn't you get ten or more than that? You know, why did you only... No, that's not how Jesus reacts. Let's keep reading. Verse number 19. And he said likewise to him. So likewise, you've been a good servant. You know, like he said to the, to the other one. Be thou also over five cities. Do you see that? Jesus just wants us to take our pound. He just wants us to take that gospel and do something with it. Some will do more. You know? Uh, some will, some, you know, some people are involved in full-time ministry. Now, some people are missionaries and, and every day they're preaching the gospel, they're getting hundreds, thousands of people saved, you know. You might say, I can't do that. But look, God just wants you to invest it. He just wants you to, to grow it. Just do something with what He's given you and he'll, he'll reward you. God wants to, Jesus Christ wants to reward us. All right. But look what happens here in verse number 20. And another came saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. So this person, instead of investing the pound, he just puts it into a napkin. He's afraid to lose it. He just puts it in a napkin, puts it away. Verse 21, why? For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man. Austere just means strict or harsh, a harsh man, a strict man. Thou uh, Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Wicked servant. Listen, we've been given such a great honor with the gospel. If we just hide it away, we don't tell anyone, we don't preach the gospel to anyone in our lives, we just hide it. God says you're a wicked servant. How could you bear seeing souls go to hell? You know, your own family, your own friends, your own community go to hell. You don't even tell them about the good news. I've left it with you so you can invest it. And he wants to reward us as well. You know, it's not empty work. Serving Christ is not empty. There's great rewards to be had. This man is seen as a wicked servant because he did not invest a pound at all. Verse 23, he says, Wherefore then... Gave us not thou money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. Look, you could have just put it into the bank. At least that way there would have been some interest on it. Okay? And I, I liken that to someone that, you know, may not be in a position to, to preach the gospel maybe weekly. Like, for example, you know, some mothers have little children, maybe multiple little children, and it's not really practical to go out and, and do that work, you know, on, on a regular basis, you know? But, at the, but what you should do is give it to another so they can invest that. So they can go and, and, and see soul saved. You know, and a great example, just, you know, my own wife, for example. You know, she's not really in a position where she can, you know, actively get out there because of the number of kids that we have. But she takes care of the kids so I can go out. All right, the other thing is she's raising a new generation that knows the Bible well, you know, so that hopefully, you know, we'll have multiple soul winners. Now, there's an investment in other people sometimes. You know, if we ever have a missionary that we support, that would be us like taking that pound and putting it into the bank. 
you know, so that way it can be invested and it can grow, you know. So we can partake in it, we can still grow in it, even if we're not necessarily being out there, but we can invest in other people, encourage other people, pray for other people, so they can be out there preaching the gospel, all right? But notice, the greater rewards are for those that actually did it themselves, that went and invested it themselves and, and, and gained uh, in, much in return. Verse number, th- verse number 25, uh, sorry, verse number 24. And he said unto them that stood by, take from him the pound and give it to him that have 10 pounds. Okay. And they said unto him, Lord, he have 10 pounds. For I say unto you that unto everyone which, um, sorry, that unto, uh, let me start again. For I say unto you that unto everyone which have shall be given and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Now, don't, don't think that means this man's lost his salvation or anything like that, okay? It's just that this man has suffered loss. The one that didn't invest his pound, he has suffered loss. You know, whatever reward, you know, could have been given to him has been taken from him and given to another, given to those that uh, show themselves faithful to God. And I'll just read to you, you actually keep your finger there, turn to 1 Corinthians. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And already, you know, we've gone through Corinthians in the past, but I would just like to read this again. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. The Bible says, If any man's work abide, which he have built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So this is what we're seeing play out in this parable. Okay? Those that have invested in the pound that God has given us, you know, you will receive a reward. But then in verse 15 it says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You see, God has great wealth, great rewards that he wants to give each one of us. Okay? Now you can be saved and never do anything for the Lord. You can take that pound, put it in a napkin, put it away, and, and not share it, not invest in it, whatever. You know, you'll still be saved, but the Bible says you're going to suffer loss, okay? What you could have earned will be lost to you, okay? And what we see in this parable, that what you could have earned is actually taken and given to others, others that were faithful. This tells me that Jesus wants to reward us. Jesus wants, he's got all this wealth, he's got all this inheritance, all these rewards, all this authority, and he's just wanting to dish it out to us he wants to give it away he's not trying to keep it all for himself he wants to share it with his servants you know and and that's what we are right now we're servants okay we're we're, we're told to occupy till he comes and while we occupy we take the position of servants it's just like when jesus came the first time he came as that lamb he came as that servant but we know when christ returns he comes to rule and reign with a rod of iron Hey, and he wants to give us authority. He says, you're, when you he, when, when he come back, no longer does he want us to be seen as servants, but as people of authority, as people with great riches, people with great rewards. All right? Christ wants to give that to us. Hey, I, I, I don't want it. Yes, you do. All right? At, at that time, at that time, you'll be like, I wish I did more for Christ. I wish I invested more heavily into his kingdom. Let's keep reading. Verse number 27. Uh, So this is the other group now. But those mine enemies, which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So we do see that he is an austere man. He is a strict, a harsh man, this nobleman. Those that did not want him to rule over them, he says, I'm going to slay them. You know, they're going to be destroyed. And we know, of course, at the rapture, when we're caught up to be with Christ, and he gives out his rewards, we know at the same time, for the, for the last three and a half years or so, roughly, you know, he's going to be slaying those that don't want him to, to, to rule and reign. Eventually, you know, he's going to come back on his white horse as well and, and slay the Antichrist and, uh, and, and the armies of the Antichrist. But, you know, Christ is strict, okay? He is harsh, he is austere, but he wants to be that way to the non-believers, to those that reject him. 
But to his servants, he wants to reward us. Okay? We want to make sure we're, the, we're, we're servants. We want to make sure we occupy till he comes. You know, God has left us here to occupy. He's left us here to do his business, to do his work. All right? And it's all going to be worth it in the end. It's all going to be worth it in the end. Let's keep reading. Verse number 28. And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to uh, Bethagi and Bethany, at the, mount called, uh, sorry, at, yeah, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of, his, two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither. So the colt is just another way of saying of a, of a horse, but we know this is also a, a, a donkey. This is an ass that is to be found. And this is the donkey that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem. But it's interesting that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a donkey that uh, a man has never sat on. This is not a, a creature that's ever been broken to the will of man. Okay, if you guys know anything about horses, you know, they don't like humans on their backs. All right? It's not something that, that's, that, that's within, them, that's natural. It's something that needs to be broken into them. You've got to break the will of the horse so, so then eventually they would allow people to sit on its back. All right, verse 31, let's keep reading. And if any man ask you, why do you lose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And they that went, sorry, and they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, why loose ye the colt? And they said, the Lord hath need of him. So I've always found this a bit of an interesting story. They come, they find the, the donkey, they start to loose it, you know, they start to, it's almost like, it's almost like they're stealing the animal, right? But, uh, you know, the, the owners see it, and it's like, what are you doing? Why are you listening? And they just say, look, the, the Lord has need of him. The Lord hath need of him. It's like, that answer seems to satisfy the owners, all right? Um, I mean, what I, t I mean, the Bible doesn't really say it, but I take, I, I believe these are, are, are believers. These are people that already know of Jesus Christ. When, when they say the Lord needs him, it's like, oh yeah, Jesus needs him. All right, you know, the Lord can take him. And I think, um, if you can keep your finger there, turn to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. And on, on Wednesday, we heard a great sermon from Brother Matt about the, uh, the gospel in, in Zechariah. But uh, it's not only the gospel that's there, there's so much there about Christ. And in Zechariah 9, 9, have a look at this. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Zechariah 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. So who's coming to Jerusalem? It's the king. It says, He is just and having salvation lowly. What does lowly mean? Humble. He comes in humility and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Okay? So we see, I, I believe that these owners know this prophecy. They've read Zechariah 9.9 and know the king's here. The king's going to Jerusalem and he's going on that ass. This is the one he needs. Take it. Have not, you know, I, I fully believe they, 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 that's what they believe because as we keep reading back in Luke, so notice that in Zechariah 9.9 it says, Thy king cometh unto thee. But it says he comes lowly. And you know, normally if you're riding an ass, it's, you know, it's a small horse. It's not very powerful. That's a picture of humility of Christ coming to Jerusalem. But we know when he comes back to establish his kingdom, he comes riding on a white horse and he comes to make war. Okay? A different, different style of coming to Jerusalem, right? In what we read in Revelation 19. But here he comes lowly, he comes in humility, he comes on that ass. And uh, let's keep reading. Go back to Luke chapter 19, verse 35. Luke 19, verse 35. It says, and they brought him to Jesus. They brought the ass, the donkey to Jesus. And they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. So, you know, I believe this is a miracle, because no man has ever sat on this horse. And now Jesus is sitting there, and it's all good. All right? It's like even the, the donkey, even the ass knows, this is the king. I'm, this is my mission. This is why I'm here. You know, it's a great thing. Keep, let's keep reading. Verse number 36. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice 
and praised God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Saying, look at this, what are they saying? Saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What do disciples see when they see Jesus coming? They see the king. They glorify the king. This tells me again, these guys know Zechariah 9.9. They know this has been fulfilled. You know, in, in the prophecies there, they're calling him the king. They're shouting with joy. Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Hey, tell your disciples they're wrong. Tell them to shut up. You know, as far as the Pharisees were concerned, this is not the king. You know, this is not the promised one. This one doesn't bring salvation. You know, and how does Jesus respond in verse 40? And, Jesus, and, and he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Okay, so the Pharisees are non-believers, you know. And Jesus says, look, even if they stop, the stones will cry out. Because why? It's a fulfillment of prophecy. It's a fulfillment of Zechariah 9, you know. And uh, this is an important moment in history, you know, a very important moment of history. Jesus making his final entrance into Jerusalem. Within the week, he would be crucified on the cross, you know. Let's keep reading, verse number 43. Uh, 41, sorry. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. So he sees Jerusalem now, he starts to weep, saying, If thou hadst known even thou, at least in this, in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. He says, look, if you knew who this is, this is, this is the Prince of Peace. This is the one that can come and bring you peace. If you just knew it. You know, this is why he's weeping. It says, but now they are hid from thine eyes. You know, it's not only that you've rejected it. It's not only that you don't want to know about it. Now it's been hid from your eyes. And what this is, this is the reprobate doctrine. You know, there are some here at this point in time in Jerusalem where God's been like, you know what? You've rejected my son long enough. And now I'm going to hide it from your eyes. Okay. There are people that cannot be saved. All right, And this is a great example of it. It's not just that they're blind. It's not just that they're refusing. God himself has hid it from their eyes. All right, Verse 43. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a, a trench about thee, and compass thee about, and keep thee in, on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. What Jesus Christ is speaking about here is making a prophecy of 70 AD, when the Romans would come and destroy Jerusalem, when, when the temple would be burnt up and there would be not, not one stone left upon another. You know? So we see as Christ comes, we see Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled, but as Christ comes in, he's making new prophecy, you know, historical fact of what happened to Jerusalem. Let's keep reading verse 45. And he went into the temple and began, and began to cast out them that, that sold therein and them that bought, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. This is known as the second cleansing of the temple. You, you might not be aware of this, but Jesus Christ twice came into the temple and, and chased out the, the money makers. Twice. Okay? This is just before his crucifixion. This is toward the end of his ministry. But it also happened at the very beginning of his ministry. All right? Now, just to prove that to you, go to John chapter 2. Because a lot of people don't know this, so I thought I'd better share this with you. Uh, go to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, verse 13. And the fact that we're just in John chapter 2 should immediately tell you this is the beginning of his ministry. Right? It's only chapter 2 into John, all right? John chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible reads, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And found, so this is not him coming on, on an ass. This is not coming on a donkey. He just goes into Jerusalem to partake of the Passover. In verse 14, And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all, uh, drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes' money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, 
Make not my father's house and house of merchandise. So that's the beginning of his ministry. He does it once. He comes now at the end of his ministry. He does it again. Okay, these guys have not learnt. These guys are back to, to making money, back to buying and selling in the temple of God, in the house of God. And that's a big no-no, all right? I mean, in the New Testament, the house of God is the local church, all right? And in this church, we are, we are never going to sell things, okay? I'm, I'm never going to have, you know, a collection of books for sale or a collection of DVDs for sale or anything like that, okay? It's never going to happen because the house of God is not a house of merchandise, okay? It's a house to come and worship God, all right? It's a house of prayer. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a big mistake that a lot of churches make. You know, um, a lot of Baptist churches, a lot of independent Baptist churches, you know, they have the right intentions. You know, they want to have material for their, for their church members. They want to have Bibles. They want to have, you know, whatever books and whatever things they think might help them in their spiritual growth. They have the right intentions. But you know what, guys? The Word of God comes first. It doesn't matter of your intentions. All right? You could have the best intentions, but you can still be disobeying the, the Word of God. You know? So, you know, I just want to be, just tell you, let you guys know, I, I never want you selling anything within the church. All right? It's, 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 it's no. You know, it's not a place of business or of selling merchandise. And by the way, these guys, they were just selling oxen and uh, doves. They were selling animals for the sacrifice, which in the Bible was fine. You could do that. But we see that they were going straight into the temple and doing it. Okay? No, it's fine to do it, but not in the temple. Okay? So, um, you know, they were changing money in the temple. So, no, you know, we, we will not allow that within our church as well. Let's go back to Luke 19, verse 47. We're almost done now. And it says here in verse 47, And he taught daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the chief of the people sought to destroy him and could not find what they might do, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. So we see these rulers, the scribes, the priests, they want to kill Jesus Christ. They want to wipe him out. You know, he's making them look bad, but they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to come to him because there's, there's multitudes of people hearing him, attentive, loving what they're hearing, okay? And uh, so, you know, these are people, like in the parable, they would not have the king to rule over them, all right? So just in conclusion, guys, I hope that's been an interesting chapter for you. You know, I, just, I really want you to think about what are you going to do with the pound that God has given you? What are you going to do with the gospel message that God has given to you? You know, how are you going to invest it? You know, we've got weekly soul winning in the church, you know, if, if you can be part of that, I strongly encourage you to be part of that. But that's not the only way to invest your pound. You know, you, we've all got family, we've all got friends that are unsaved. You know, another way is, is by talking to them, by sharing the gospel to them, investing it in that way. You know, or like I said, if you just physically can't, you know, maybe you've got little children or a number of them, or maybe you're sick and you, whatever, maybe you've got a problem. You know, how are you helping others to get out there? You know, how are you investing that pound into the bank? so the bank can make interest for you? you know, how are you enabling others to get out there and do uh, the gospel preaching, you know, making sure that there's some return of investment? Because, guys, I would be really embarrassed for God to come. Because, you know, as a pastor, I'm also required to give an account for my church. You know? I'd be really embarrassed if God said to me, you had a wicked servant in your church. I'd say, what do you mean, Lord? You know, they hid the pound. They put it in the napkin. They put it away. And they did nothing with it. You know, I'd be, I'd be embarrassed to, to face that with Christ. You know, so this is why, you know, a lot of, all of the preaching, I mean, I can't help it. Every chapter is about soul winning. <laughs> Every chapter, I can't help it. But this is why, you know, I, I don't really stop necessarily and, and just preach one uh, sermon on preaching the gospel. I don't need to. You know, but this is why I filter it in every, pretty much every sermon, the importance of it, the importance of it. It's because if you're not doing it, if you're not investing that pound, I want to make you uncomfortable. You know, I, I want to give you some guilt. You know, I, I want to compel you to get out there and do something with the pound that Jesus Christ has given you. Okay, first of all, because I'm the pastor and I've got to give an account for you. But most of all, because you have to stand before Christ one day and your works are going to be tried. You know, and I don't want you to stand there embarrassed that everything you've done was a waste. Everything you've done was, was burnt up. I want you to be left with something. So God can say, Jesus Christ can say to you, you know, thou good and faithful servant. You know, uh, 
and he's not asking us to do much. You can just invest in the bank if you want. Just get something out of it. Just do something with what God has given you, you know. And Christ wants to reward us openly. You know, he wants to reward us. And, uh, you know, he's a great God. He wants us to participate in the inheritance that he has. All right, let's pray.